Okay. So welcome everybody, and it's a pleasure and, and honor to introduce uh, our speaker today. Sorry, my daughters are working in the background. So our speaker today is Klaus Riesberger, who everybody knows him, but uh, I have to say some words about him. So everybody knows him from Vienna first, because he worked there and lived there for decades. Uh, currently, he's, uh, he's at the Royal Holloway University in London. And he specialized on game theory, microeconomics, and finance. He published his results in top journals like Econometrica, for example, or Review of Economic Studies, Games of Human Behavior. And he serves as a referee for top journals too. And today he will present the results. Now I've lost connection. Yes, it seems that Miklos is not with us for a few seconds. So, um, okay, so until uh, Miklos uh, joins us, uh, let's go on to the main dish. Uh, Klaus, um, please. Okay, thanks a lot. So thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to present some of my work here. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Jürgen Webel and Peter Wickman. Uh, with Jürgen I've co-authored before. Peter Wickman is one of uh, Jürgen's brilliant students who just graduated a year ago or so. And uh, this strange title, Solid Outcomes in Finite Games, is really uh, about a topic that is most familiar to you. However, we take a somewhat uh, different approach this time around. And the approach is motivated by the question of why game theory is actually useful for things like economics or other social sciences. And when you think about this, there's two answers that come to mind. One is you know, the purely pedagogical value of game theory that it sharpens your mind uh, and uh, makes you understand strategic interaction a bit better. The other one is applications. Now, of course, game theory, since it's game theory is actually not a theory, it's more like a language, right? Uh, so it's being applied not only in economics, but also in political science and other fields. But when we apply games here in economics, then we very often try to explain something that we see in the real world right? or in the data or something like that. Some persistent phenomenon or some stylized facts that are hard to explain with the usual competitive model of economics because these phenomena often involve some aspect of strategic interaction. So indeed, I've not only worked on the pure theory of, of games, I've also worked on applications a lot. And when you think about applications, then you realize that what you're trying to explain is typically a phenomenon that realizes under a, var a variety of different circumstances. So it is a phenomenon that must be robust to the details of what happens, right? Because otherwise we wouldn't see it so often in the real world. So a phenomenon that is well explained by game theory is something that must be robust, not only to the usual strategy perturbations, the Selton's trembles, right? but also against lots of other things, against the, the payoff specification that we write down as analysts, uh, also against the representation of the game, right? whether it's an extensive form game or a normal form game, and many other specif specifications. So in a sense, the value of game theory derives from being a very stylized representation of what we see in the world. So it is like, it's like a roadmap, right? Very stylized, but useful. So that's the first thought that comes to mind when you reason about applications of game theory. The other one 
is that in applications, what you really care about is observables. Things that are reflected in the data or reflected in whatever you observe by whatever means. In economics, we often don't have the laboratories of physics. We don't run large hadron colliders, uh, but we rely on statistical data, the ONS, so the, which is the Office of National Statistics here in the UK. Uh, that's the data that we rely on, right? So it's not really the counterfactuals that are so important, but what is important is what we can see in the data or in observations. This is a bit at odds with the older literature uh, because in the older literature, uh, often players made speeches to each other in counterfactual circumstances that never materialize in equilibrium. Now these speeches can never be really observed, right? Because they are off equilibrium. So they can also not be tested right? and they cannot be refuted. So when you take this approach that you want robust outcomes, observable outcomes, that are invariant with respect to details of the model, then of course, uh, that will ring a bell for, to many of you, at least the older ones. <laughs> Sounds a bit familiar, right? It does. Uh, of course, what comes to mind immediately is the refinements of Nash equilibrium debate in the 1980s and 90s, and of course, strategic stability later on. True, that's also what we considered first, but all these things have drawbacks. So if you look, for instance, at extensive form refinements, like subgame perfection, sequential equilibrium, uh, and whatever, then all these extens extensive form refinements are actually sensitive to inessential transformations of the extensive form, the Thomson transformations, right? So Thomson transformations are like, you know, in a simultaneous move game between two players, turn around the order in which the players move, right? Make player two move first and then player one. That's one of them, interchanging simultaneous moves. Another one of those transformations is that uh, a player decides between three outcomes and the player can either do that simultaneously or we split it into two uh, decisions, one where he either takes outcome A or not. And if not, he decides between outcome B and C. That's coalescing of information sets. So these are really transformations that shouldn't matter, at least if you adhere to a rationality paradigm. So these extensive form refinements are not completely satisfactory. The other approach by imposing strategy trembles that dates back to Selton's ideas, uh, like perfect and proper equilibrium, they have another disadvantage, namely they are fragile to adding or deleting dominated strategies, which is also not very nice, right? Then of course, you know, these are not new things. And uh, people thought about this uh, 30 years ago or more, uh, which led of course to the strategic stability debate. Now indeed str strategically stable sets, at least in the ultimate formulation by Mertens uh, in the late eighties and early nineties, they do satisfy lots of invariances. But if you think of it, if you look at a very simple example, say a two by two game with two strict Nash equilibria, then there are actually three strategically stable sets. All of them are singletons. Two of them are the two strict equilibria, but the mixed equilibrium, which must be there, is also a strategically stable set. 
uh, that strikes us as a bit odd uh, because, you know, uh, on the continent, everybody drives on the right side of the road. Here on the British Isles, they drive on the wrong, uh, sorry, the left side of the road. But I don't know of many countries uh, where they randomize whether to drive on the left or the right side of the road. Maybe with the exception of India. <laughs> So there's still something to be done in a sense. But what we want to do is really emphasize. Excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. excuse me I have a quick um, comment on the slide before. Um, the fact that applications do not care about um, counterfactuals, I probably you don't need this for your argument because otherwise a lot of macro and applied micro empirical papers would not be there because they all care about what would happen if you take different taxes or different things. So. I just didn't want to leave this. It's a little bit of a two. I don't think you want to pick fights about that. Oh no, but that's a different argument, Carl. No, but uh, you're saying, yeah. No, no, but let, let me, let me uh, answer that because that's important to understand. So uh, what, for instance, a macro paper does that does counterfactual policy experiments is it computes the equilibrium, the equilibrium path if some exogenous parameter were changed. Right? So this is something that we would observe, would the world have been different, okay? So it is about the equilibrium pass, not about off equilibrium behavior. Right? And refinements, or at least some of the refinements, not all of them, but some of the refinements were based on very elaborate stories of what, about what happens off equilibrium. Happen, happens in pure counterfactual circumstances, which, you know, even though I, I've written papers like that myself, so I, I shouldn't be too harsh on that, but it strikes me as something that is at odds with the idea of observability, right? That's really the argument, okay? Does that answer your question? Well, I think you know, that clarifies. We'll see how how your model looks, but that clarified it to some. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, in order to combine the ideas of observability and robustness, we actually depart from the traditional approach to think of the solution as strategy profiles. Right. So, a Nash equilibrium is formulated as a strategy profile. That's the solution concept. Uh, later solution concepts like strategically stable sets are sets of strategy profiles. Our solution concept will not be formulated in terms of strategy profiles, but in terms of outcomes. Whereby an outcome, what I mean is a probability distribution on the place of an extensive form. Okay, plays are complete paths from the root to the terminal node in an extensive form. And an outcome is a probability distribution on these plates. Okay, so that's going to be our object, which means that we may not be able to exactly say how this particular outcome is supported off equilibrium. Of course, we know that it is supported in some way or the other, but there could be multiple ways in which this is supported off equilibrium, okay? What we really care about is what happens in the end, right? Which terminal node do we reach with positive probability, okay? So this is the solution concept that we propose. It's called solid outcomes. And it's based on combining two things, robustness properties that come from index theory and a set valued concept, which we call game blocks. I'll define this in a moment and you'll see what it is, but that's really the idea to use on the one hand, a strong robustness criterion, non-zero index, together with a set valued concept that gets rid of the mixed equilibrium in two by two games with two strict equilibria. Okay, that's that's the idea, and it's actually a very simple idea in the end. Now, for this concept, we 
prove a number of invariance properties and robustness properties, basically everything that has been proposed. And then finally, we also study the relation of this concept to Myers and sustainability notion. I think sustainability has been on the table in this seminar already uh, about a year or more ago uh, when Rida Laraki presented his paper with Harry Govindan and Lucas Paar on sustainable equilibrium. So the idea of sustainability is essentially that, um, let me formulate it first for equilibrium. So an equilibrium is sustainable if by adding extra strategies to the game, I can make it unique. So that's the basic idea. Now we're not going to use exactly this idea because we want to work with a block or a set valued concept. Uh, I'll explain a little later which version of sustainability we use, but the intuition is very much the same. Now, what is the domain of our solution concept that I should say up front? So the domain of our solution concept is a generic class of finite expensive form games with perfect recall, okay? All right, any questions at this point? Because otherwise I'm gonna dive into the notation and the, the meat of the talk. Yes, I've got a question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so you say that basically instead of looking at strategy profiles, you consider the outcome. Yes. But can't you reverse engineer the given that you define a, a solid outcome? Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you reverse engineer the strategy profiles? Because of course now some outcomes off of the path, uh, they you don't know what the strategy would have been there. But if you now change the game, then you can eventually find what the strategy would have been. So basically, I am asking. Isn't there still a one-to-one -one correspondence between the outcomes? And the strategy profiles? Yes. No, it's not one-to-one. -one. You, you're right that to a certain extent, you can reverse engineer what happens off equilibrium, but it's not one-to-one. -one. You may end up with multiple strategies that support a given outcome, okay? And that's actually, if you think of it, when you look at an when you work on an application that is formulated in extensive form, that's actually what you do. Right? You show that the equilibrium path that you derive in your application is supported off equilibrium by certain behaviors. Yeah. But these need not be unique. There could be many that support that. Right? So the player off equilibrium plays a certain option with sufficiently high probability, right? That's good enough. Mm. So yeah. we end up with an interval, right? The probability has to be sufficiently high, has, has a lower bound and an upper bound, but this whole interval is possible to support the equilibrium. That's good enough. And I don't see why we should pick one particular point of equilibrium from this interval. As long as I can show that there is an interval that supports that the equilibrium, I'm fine. And, and I actually in the applications that I wrote, I never did more. I showed that it can be supported by you know, something like sufficiently high probability, but not what exactly this probability is. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I understand and I, I agree with you uh, to the extent I understand what you say. I think you're right that indeed there is no need to exactly specify the concrete probability as long as it's sufficiently high so that the off, yeah. the, off the equilibrium path is good enough. But I'm thinking may, maybe you can still engineer a game such that your solution will have to end up a game where the solid outcomes will be forced to define this probability exactly, but probably does not. Well, that's, yes. So, uh, of course, in some games, that's true. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll see an example of that. Later. So, or let me uh, say this right again. Think of a perfect information game, okay? A generic perfect information game, but then no ties, okay? 
Then, of course, as you will see, uh, the solid outcome is unique and you can actually reverse engineer everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it's one to one. Mm -hmm. But in general, that doesn't need to be the case. Mm -hmm. And actually, why, why would we want it to be the case? There's no point, right? Yeah. Uh, there can be different strategies, indeed, different strategies, but uh, traditional strategies. Supporting, yes, yes, you, you have convinced me. Thanks. I think you have convinced me. I also okay. have a quick question, Klaus. Um, will you, given your introduction, will you also have an application in economics that you will then show us um, that we get some new insights? Or is this more a preliminary step toward later on applications? I'll not show you an application from economics, I'll show you an applications from political science. Okay, that's good too. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I also have a question. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, do you, rip, uh, and to some extent, you could say the uh, the fact that we have a tree is a bit artificial, because sometimes you have the same outcome for different histories. Would you also allow? I mean, probably not yet, but I mean, have the same outcome uh, uh, coming up at different leaves of the game tree? So, I define an outcome to be a probability distribution on the place of the extensive form. So once you pick an outcome, or once you pick a degenerate outcome, a probability one on one of the place, you know exactly what the equilibrium path is. Sure. Okay. So the term outcome here does refer to a probability distribution on place, and not this. Um, this the word outcome has also been used for this intermediate map, right? So that. Yeah, uh, in game forms. Yeah, in, in game forms, yes, that uh, you map from the place then into an outcome or a consequence, right, uh, over which the players have utility. I, I take this map to be the identity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I'm fine. Thank you. Good. Okay. Then let's dive into the notation. So th this should be pretty much standard. Uh, normal form games are here denoted by G. Uh, S is the pure strategy space, so the space of pure strategy profiles, everything finite. Uh, U is the payoff function. When you see a tilde over the, the game, that usually means we refer to the mixed extension, where the strategy space is the product of the mixed strategy simplices. Uh, and with a slight abuse of notation, we'll denote the pay a function on that also by little u, even though it's extended by expected utility, okay? Now, just to remind you of, an, uh, of how we get to the to reductions of the normal form, uh, pay of equivalent, so two strategies of the same player are called pay of equivalent. If they give the same payoffs to all players for all strategy combinations among the opponents. This is the traditional notion of how you define the equivalence there. And that's a little bit stronger than what we actually need. What we actually need is, is uh, Kuhn's original strategic stability notion that two strategies of the same player are strategically equivalent if they lead to the same outcome for all strategy combinations among the opponents, okay? That would be good enough for what we do, but you know, uh, because of historical reasons, uh, the payoff equivalence notion is used to go to the, re the purely reduced normal form or the pure strategy reduced normal form, which is essentially the normal form that you get when you collapse all the payoff equivalence classes for each player into single representatives. So you take the strategy space to be the quotient. Okay, that gives you the what we call the purely reduced normal form. Uh, the best reply correspondences will always be denoted by beta. So beta i is player i's pure best reply correspondence. When the tilde decorates the beta, then it's, it's the mixed best reply correspondences. And when I drop the subscript, what I mean is the product correspondences, either pure or mixed. And I guess in this audience, I don't need to explain what the Nash equilibrium is, right? <laughs> uh, 
Now, uh, a somewhat less familiar notion is the notion of a pure strategy block, but it's a very simple object. So a block is simply a product set of pure strategy subsets, non-empty pure strategy subsets, one for each player. That's a block, okay? And of course, once I have a block, I can associate with a block, the block game in which all the players are restricted to play in their factors of the block, okay? And the payoff function is then restricted to the block. That gives me the block game. Now blocks have actually been used as solution concepts for a very long time. Right? I think the earliest thing is uh, iteratively undominated strategies, which of course gives you a block in the end, right? and then rationalizable strategies. Um, so blocks have been used as solution concepts. And there are finer concepts than iteratively undominated strategies or rationalizable strategies. Two examples of finer block concepts are curb sets. Curb is short for closed under rational behavior. So a block is curb if all the best replies to mixed strategy profiles supported in the block are in the block. Okay. This concept has been introduced by Jürgen and, and Kaushik Basu in, I believe, the early 90s or something like that. So it's a pretty old concept. A more recent block concept is Peter Wickman's Nash block concept, which says that a block B is called a Nash block if for all equilibria of the block game, all the best replies are in the block. Okay, that's what Peter calls a Nash block. All right, then next, let me remind you of one structure of the set of Nash equilibria of finite normal form games, namely that the set of Nash equilibria consists of finitely many closed and connected components. Uh, I think the first one to claim that was Kohlberg and Mertens in the mid eighties. Um, but it's basically a, a re relatively simple consequence of the fact that uh, the, the Nash equilibrium correspondence is a semi-algebraic map, okay? And this is gonna be important for us that um, these components. Now, as a definition, let's say that a block respects equilibrium components if every Nash equilibrium component is either a subset of the phase spanned by the block or disjoint from the phase spanned by the block. Okay, so it's either in, inside or outside. It doesn't go across, okay? That's what respects equilibrium components means. And now with that, I can define our solution concept. So let me first start with the set valued part, which is a block called a game block. So a game block is a block that first respects equilibrium components. And second, it's such that the index sum across all the equilibrium components in the phase spanned by the block is plus one. Okay, like it would be for the full game. Okay, so in a sense, a game block you can think of as a smaller game of its own, right? And indeed, in the end, we'll show that that is actually the case, right? That you can think of it that way. So, this is just strategy blocks, the game blocks. Now, to come to the solid outcomes. Uh, let's denote by W the set of plays for a finite extensive form game, and uh, by this M of W the set of outcomes that are induced by mixed strategy profiles. If I pick an equilibrium component, then M with the subscript for this equilibrium component 
denotes the outcomes that are induced by the equilibria in the component. Okay. And with this notation, here's the definition of a solid outcome. So a solid outcome is an outcome, so a probability distribution on place, such that this is the only the unique outcome that is induced by an equilibrium component with non-zero index and support in a minimal game block. Where by minimal, I mean set inclusion, minimal with respect to set inclusion. Okay, that's the concept. So to repeat, a solid outcome is a probability distribution on place that is the unique outcome induced by all equilibria in an equilibrium component with non and support in a minimal game block. Okay. That's the definition, and that's the concept that we're going to study. Now, a first result, it's actually not really a result, it's just a, an observation, right? Solid outcomes exist for a generic class of finite extensive form games with perfect recall. That's a direct uh, implication of the old result by Krebs and Wilson that for finite extensive form games with perfect recall, there's only a finite number of equilibrium outcomes. Okay. So we have generic existence, and that's straightforward. That's not even versus of proposition. Now, to study the properties of this solution concept, uh, traditionally one begins with looking at backwards induction. Okay, whether this is consistent with backwards induction. Uh, now, in order to check for backwards induction, I'll employ not sequential equilibrium, but an, employ a somewhat stronger criterion that was introduced by Eric van Damme in the early 80s, implies sequential equilibrium, but is much nicer, right? And that's called quasi-perfect equilibrium. Many of you will know that, but let me repeat what it is. So a quasi-perfect equilibrium is a behavior strategy profile such that every neighborhood of it contains a completely mixed behavior strategy profile against which the equilibrium is a best reply at all information sets, okay? And, you know, stating this definition, uh, you can probably sense why I like this concept, because I have been able to define it without mentioning beliefs at all, okay? <laughs> now, of course, every quasi-perfect equilibrium is a sequential equilibrium, but not the other way around, because quasi-perfect has stronger implications. For instance, uh, the continuation strategies at the given information set are undominated which is not in general the case for sequential equilibrium, okay? But the proposition that gives us backwards induction here simply says that every solid outcome is supported by a quasi-perfect and hence sequential equilibrium. So solid outcomes are consistent with backwards induction in this sense. Okay. But for, if I may ask, um, yeah. Sure. Existence you only have in the generic, that's why you need genericity, I suspect, because for three player games, you might not have quasi perfect equilibrium in general, as far as I know. Uh, this is generous. So, this actually is always true. Uh, the generic class we need uh, because we define solid outcomes uh, as a singleton. Let me emphasize this again. So, if you look at the definition of a solid outcome, we say that this probability distribution on place is the unique outcome induced by all equilibria in the component C that has non-zero index and support in a minimal game block, okay? Now, of course, there's a trivial generalization of this definition. It says a set of solid outcomes is the set of outcomes induced by the equilibria in a non-zero index component with support in a minimal game block, okay? But because of this, uh, of, because we started with applications, right? Uh, we are saying, we're insisting here on uniqueness. 
And that's where we need the genericity, okay? Because the Krebs and Wilson result uh, that there's only finitely many Nash equilibrium outcomes holds on the generic class of finite extensive form games. That's where we need genericity. Okay, yeah. Okay. It's not needed for the proposition about backwards induction. Okay, so quasi perfect, we have quasi perfect implicitly. And that you could use to reverse engineer uh, what happens off equilibrium if you want. Okay. There are, of course, other tests for uh, backwards induction or consistency with backwards induction. For instance, one uh, quite informative test is often to see what this concept does on perfect information games right? or in generic perfect information games. Well, this is what the next proposition does. So we look at a generic finite extensive form game with perfect information. And then for this, this class of games, there's always a unique solid outcome. That unique solid outcome coincides with the outcome induced by the unique subgame perfect equilibrium. And the unique solid outcome is supported on a unique minimal game block, okay? So that works very nicely. Everything becomes unique when you are in generic perfect information games and it's consistent with the old idea of, of Kuhn, Kuhn's algorithm uh, subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay. Uh, um, your yes. definition, your leading definition um, involves indexes as a in part of the definition. Now application means that there are applied people might be using this. Can you give an equivalent definition that doesn't involve indexes or? No. Why should I not use the index? The index is much easier to apply than any kind of tremble or uh, computing uh, homology groups or stuff like that. Uh, I don't it's, think an it's just applied person would ever use a homology group. No, I was thinking more about no, applied no, people. Certainly not, but, uh, no, but you can, computing can, the determinant yeah. of a matrix, uh, that's easy, right? That can even an applied person can do. Also, you can give a characterization. I mean, the index one ones are the potentially unique ones from, uh, that you extend the game and then it and, becomes a unique. Yes, yeah, I'll come to that a little later. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sustainability part. <laughs> But uh, you know, I, I don't uh, see why you shouldn't apply the index because it's just computing the determinant of uh, a matrix, right? And, and uh, you don't even have to do that nowadays. The computer does that for you, right? And it's much easier than looking for uh, proper perturbations uh, or looking for uh, computing the homology groups in, in Mertens definition of strategically stable sets or, or things like that, right? The, in, the index is, is really easy to apply. Right? Carl, are you happy with that? I'm very happy. I think this is something that one has to think about, but I see the point now. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, one question. So the proposition is basically a consequence of your previous proposition and your work with De Michelis and Swinkers, right? Indeed, yes, absolutely, okay. yes. Okay. So a, a lot of these propositions are straightforward if you know the literature. Thanks. Yes. Okay, actually also the next proposition is pretty much straightforward. Uh, it's actually three, three different statements, but uh, the proofs are identical for the three statements. So it's the same proof. So that's why we combined these invariance properties here in one statement. Uh, so this, this invariance here is about deleting a strategy for, for one player. Right? So suppose we look at the game and we have a game block B, and then for some player, we take a strategy that is not in his factor of the game block and delete it from the game. Okay, that gives us this game G prime, okay? Now then B continues to be a, a, a game block for the game G prime if at least one of the following three conditions are met. Either the deleted strategy is weakly dominated or it's payoff equivalent to a mixture of over other strategies or it's not a best reply against any strategy profile with support in the block. Okay. Now, of course, these 
these three invariances have different meanings, but the proof is the same for all of them. What are their meanings? Well, A, a the first one, that I can delete a weakly dominated strategy, implies that game blocks and solid outcomes are immune to the removal or addition of dominated strategies, okay? Which is not the case for things like perfect and proper, okay? The second one implies that game blocks and solid outcomes are invariant to the extensive form representation of the game. Uh, because it means that a solid outcome and the game block or a minimal game block only depend on the purely reduced normal form of the game. And the Thompson theorem or its uh, somewhat improved version by Elmas and Rainey uh, basically is a characterization theorem that says uh, two extensive forms differ from each other by these three uh, well, Thompson had four, but Elmas and Rainey had three transformations. So they differ from each other by these three transformations, if and only if the two games have the same purely reduced normal form, okay? So the details of the extensive forms don't matter. That's what statement B says. And then finally, C is a, a traditional, uh, the uh, NWBR property that game blocks and solid outcomes survive the removal of never weak best replies. Okay. Was there a question? I have a question. I'm a little bit slow today. Um, a, no. it looks like a removal of dominant strategies that do not belong to the block is missing. Yes. Because, because you could also remove dominant strategies within the block and then it would change, right? Uh, you could, yes. And that's but what I, but that's what I thought would be this statement, would, right? Because we're interested in whether we can remove dominant strategies, but you say, no, no, we have to first check whether it's in the block and then only can we remove it if it's outside the block. Actually, we can remove it also if it's in the block, but so then the block to has to change because I removed the strategy. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> and, is that, and that works then? That also works, yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, thank you. Okay, so these are the, the first three invariants that I adopt somewhat uh, uh, strangely independence of irrelevant alternatives. Um, there's a further invariance, which is a little bit more difficult to introduce. Uh, so let me first explain the intuition and then formally define it. The intuition is the following. If you have an extensive form game, and you look at a particular terminal node and then replace this terminal node by a subgame, which is such that the subgame has a unique and completely mixed equilibrium that gives exactly the same expected payoffs as the terminal node would have given. Right? If we do this transformation, then our solution should not be affected. Uh, lacking a better name, I called this invariance the myerson Vable invariance, <laughs> because it pops up in uh, the, the paper by Roger and Jürgen in Econometrica. So let me define what it is in the normal form. So you take a game and look at the particular strategy profile R, okay? And then you construct a new game by replacing the strategy little ri for each player i by a set of strategies in such a way that the payoffs in the new game are the same as in the old game, except when the players use the strategies in this block r, okay? And the payoffs when they use strategies in this block R are chosen such that the block game restricted to the block R has a unique and completely mixed equilibrium whose payoffs are exactly the payoffs that the strategy profile R would have generated, okay? So th this is this Mayer's and Weibull transformation. And then in order to formulate the invariance, we need to say what happens with the block, right? 
so if, if R is not in the block at all, then nothing happens. Uh, the block B hat is the same as the block B. If R for some player is in the block B, then we have to take away the, stra the singleton strategy little ri and add in the set of strategies capital ri. Okay, that's how we get the corresponding block in the game g hat in the transformed game. And then the proposition says that if b is a game block in g, then this newly constructed game block b hat is a game block in g hat. And if b is minimal in g, then b hat is minimal in g hat. Okay. So we can do this intuitively replacing terminal nodes by subgames with a unique equilibrium. Okay, that doesn't affect the solution either. Wait, wait, wait. You say a unique equilibrium, it's a unique completely mixed equilibrium. Yes, you need to. That's something very different. Because something, so I was going to ask you, why are we interested at all in completely mixed equilibrium? I would have thought I would like to do this for a unique equilibrium, but that, but you cannot do it for that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know why I don't like the mixed equilibrium no, anyway. So, so we did consider that question. We just uh, because it, in in the the paper by Roger Myerson and Jürgen Webel, they also used completely mixed. So we just adopted this. So is there a reason why we should be interested in this completely mixed um, focus? That's I, the motivation for that. Doesn't this matter for minimality? That if you have a non complex mixed strategy, you can throw something out already? That could happen, yeah. That could be one thing that could happen. So if we, for instance, took a pure one and then added a, a dominated, a conditionally dominated strategies, the minimality would not work, yeah. So anyway, we, we took this uh, to be completely mixed unique and completely mixed because in Myers and Babel they do the same thing. But that's a good question. I should actually take a note whether we need completely mixed. Okay. Then of course uh, there's the question of why is this solution concept preferable to strategically stable sets? Right? Because strategic stability, at least in the Mertens formulation uh, by the end of the 80s, that uh, satisfies lots of invariances. And I always get the number wrong. It's something between nine and 11 or so. Uh, so I certainly missed some of those that I listed here. Well, the thing is, this proposition here tells us we do the same thing as strategic stability, essentially. Every solid outcome is supported by a strategy profile in a strategically stable set. So all these invariances are there. And the reason is simply that uh, every component with non-zero index contains a strategically stable set. That is a result that I proved with Stefano also quite, a, quite some time ago. So all these invariances are there. And moreover, the supporting notion of a game block uh, is something that behaves very nicely. Right? So game blocks in a sense are continuous almost everywhere. Or to make the sense precise, here's the proposition about the generic continuity of game blocks. So if we think about the payoff space, so which is the space of payoff assignments to a fixed extensive form, then we can break this apart into a finite number of subsets, where the first one, this U sub naught, is what you could call the critical set. So it's a closed and lower dimensional semi-algebraic subset. And the complement of this critical set is made up of finitely many, uh, is, is made up, is a disjoint union of finitely many uh, sets U1 to UH, such that on each of those components, if you want, the correspondence that assigns game blocks is constant. 
so in particular continuous right so that's what i mean by generic continuity on these generic sets uh game blocks are actually constant okay so that tells us that the supporting notion behaves very very nicely over payoff space and then oh i see i'm, I'm a bit pressed for time uh then let me turn to what Bernhard already mentioned, uh, sustainability. So the idea, Roger Meyerson's idea about sustainability was basically that you look at an equilibrium, a point, and say that this point is sustainable if you can pull away all the other equilibria, and this is the only equilibrium that remains. Okay. Now, uh, Govindan, uh, Laraki and, and Paul have a very nice paper where they do this for points, for, equi for equilibrium points and characterize sustainability there. We do that here for blocks, okay? Otherwise, our concept about sustainable blocks is pretty much uh, a copy of what is done in Govindan and et al., except that we do, uh, we replace the equilibria, so they look at game equilibrium pairs, find an equivalence relation for game equilibrium pairs. We define an equivalence relation for game block pairs, right? So if we have two such pairs, a game and a block for that game, and another pair, a game G prime and the block B prime, we call them block equivalent. If the blocks that are generated by taking the best replies against equilibria in this block or in the phase spanned by the block for both games are actually the same game, identical, except for, you know, relabeling players and strategies, okay? Then we call such two pairs of game block, a game block pair, we call them block equivalent. Okay, and then we for a game G, we call a block B sustainable if it respects equilibrium components, and there is some other game G prime with a block B prime such that the pairs G and B is equivalent to the pair G prime and B prime. But in G prime, the set of all Nash equilibria is contained in the phase spanned by B prime. So that's again this notion of pulling away everything else, all the equilibria that are outside of B. Of B right? So B, uh, G prime is the game where we've pulled away all the other equilibria that are outside of the phase spanned by the block B. So it's a natural set valued version of uh, the existing definition of sustainability. And then the proposition says, uh, this actually characterizes game blocks. So a, a block is a game block if and only if it is sustainable. It's the same thing. Okay. So that's our description of our solution concept. And now in the last five minutes to satisfy Carl, I'll go through some examples and also show you an application. Uh, the first one is not really an application because this is uh, a game that has been developed to test refinement concepts that show and Krebs, the, the, sig the, the beer cache signaling game. Uh, in the beer cache signaling game, we just verified that our solution concept is nice, right? It picks the intuitive equilibrium where player one sends the strong signal and player two will always fight with at least probability one half if he sees a weak signal, right? That's simply because in this game, there are two equilibrium components, one with index plus one and the other with index zero, okay? Now here's the application for Carl. Uh, it's not from economics, but from political science. Uh, and in political science, this is known as the chairman paradox. So this is a committee of three people that have to choose an alternative by majority voting. And their preferences, if they would uh, vote sincerely, their preferences are caught in a condensate cycle, okay? 
This is what is captured by, so lambda is here a number between zero and one. So this is captured by these payoffs here. They are caught in the conversation cycle. Now this game has two equilibrium components. One that ends up with the most preferred option for the chairman, right? Or oh, I should say what the, what the chairman is. The chairman is player one here, the, the guy who chooses matrices. And the chairman has the right uh, to decide which alternative is chosen at a tie. Right? So if the votes tie, then the chairman basically gets his preferred option uh, from the tie, okay? So one equilibrium component is the one where he actually gets his most preferred option A. The other component is the one where the chairman ends up with the, his worst or her worst option C, right? That's the one that the chairman really hates or the chairwoman. Now, this game has a unique solid outcome and the unique solid outcome is the one where the chairman gets his or her worst option, the option C, okay? So again, uniqueness. Oops, just two minutes left. Uh, this here is a game that uh, is well known in literature. literature. It also appears, I think, in my textbook somewhere. Uh, this is an outside option game that has two components of equilibrium. One is what the older literature used to call the forward induction equilibrium, where player one moves into the sub game, which consists of the first three strategies. Right? And the other one is the outside option component, okay? Now in this particular game here, the forward induction equilibrium has index minus one and the outside option component has index plus two. And the minimal game block here is everything except for the third strategy of player one, okay? So in other words, this is a game where both outcomes, both the forward induction outcome and the outside option are solid outcomes. This is a difference to what uh, Govinda and Laraki and Paul do because they where they do the point valued sustainability exercise. They take this then actually from points to components of equilibria by offering axioms that end up giving you positive index components. So they would here choose the outside option component because that has a positive index. And of course, we could do the same thing by just changing the definition of a solid outcome and replacing non-zero by positive, right? Uh, but we're a bit hesitant here. So uh, in this game, I think the three of us are a bit agnostic on what is the better thing, right? So, we declare them both to be solid. And finally, uh, what I already foreshadowed in the introduction, if you look at this coordination game, now it's with coordination game with three strategies. This has seven equilibria, right? The three strict ones where the players all coordinate. Then there is one completely mixed and three partially mixed equilibria between the pairs, the coordination pairs, essentially. Okay. Now, in this example here, the completely mixed equilibrium, unlike in two by two games, right, in this example, the completely mixed equilibrium has index plus one, but it is not, does not induce a solid outcome because the uh, unique, there are only three minimal game blocks and those are the strict equilibrium. Right? So our concept here kills the completely mixed equilibrium because it's not supported in a minimal game block. Again, the uh, Govinda and Laraki and, and Paul paper would pick the completely mixed equilibrium as a sustainable equilibrium, okay? Which we don't really like that much because this is a very unstable equilibrium, which actually in most dynamics that you put here, evolutionary dynamics, it turns into a source. Right? It's, it's not just a saddle, it's a source, right? It's very unstable. 
On the other hand, because it has positive index, uh, it's sustainable, the completely mixed equilibrium. And here's actually the game where all the other equilibria are pulled away, if you want, right? and the completely mixed equilibrium is the unique equilibrium. Okay. So this game here that uh, I added three strategies over uh, Bernhard's student uh, <laughs> added three strategies. These three strategies pull away all the, the other equilibrium and leaves only the completely mixed one. Okay? So there we have to accept the completely mixed equilibrium as the solid outcome. Indeed, the unique, unique minimal game block here is the coordination block of the first three strategies. Right? But there is only a unique block that is closed under better replies. And that happens to be the whole strategy space. And this last observation is important to relate this to evolutionary dynamics because Jürgen and I have a very old paper where we characterize the phases spanned by blocks uh, when they are asymptotically stable. And the characterization is they must be closed on the beta replies, which is not the case here. So here we accept an, a solid outcome that in no reasonable evolutionary dynamics can be stable, okay? And now uh, I'm already three minutes over time, so let me summarize. So what we do is we want to combine observability with robustness properties, and that leads us to solid outcomes. And solid outcomes and the supporting concept of game blocks, they have extremely strong robustness and invariance properties, and they can be characterized as being sustainable blocks. An open question is what, whether we should uh, strengthen this by going from non-zero index to positive index, given the insights that uh, the other sustainability paper has provided. Thanks very much. Any more questions? Thank you. That was your kid, right? <laughs> so, any questions or remarks, colleagues? I'm, have, I'm slightly confused by the chairman paradox. You're saying the zero index, did I remember that well, that the, the zero index one is also solid? No. No. The, there's a unique solid outcome here, only where the chairman gets the worst uh, alternative his or her worst alternative. That's the unique solid outcome. And the index zero is intuitively because she gets to break ties. Is that the reason that's, that's yes. why she gets the outcome? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Yeah. So the tie breaking is kind of what shouldn't happen. I mean, yes. that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah so the, the intuition is basically that the other two people foresee that in the case of a tie, the chairman would break the tie in his or her favor. Okay. And that's why they actually take the other equilibrium, right? the other outcome. That's the intuition. Okay, so the, the paradox prevails. <laughs> the paradox prevails, absolutely. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I can always ask a question. Um, Klaus, um, so as usually very thought provoking and nice and clear um, presentation, thank you very much. Um, what makes a solution concept a good and useful solution concept? So I understand here, I'm um, very nicely structured um, things to look at, but as you have, the, have this variation, the definition that you haven't made up your mind on, or also this, um, this mixing of these 10-10, um, how do you want to justify a solution concept? I mean, it's a general question, right? But what is your, you went through the examples that you liked and tried to support them, or what was, what's the reason why you would support it and a, a solution concept? Because I value existence higher than, uh, getting rid of mixed equilibria. I don't okay, want to- but, but then you still have the variation, the definition between positive index and non-zero. Oh, between positive, yeah. But in, the, in this example here, uh, positive index and non-zero index agree because there's only one equilibrium that has index plus one. So it was, it was a general question, how you- Oh, generally, I mean, how- right, So, you, so you're, they're claiming, you are basically claiming that your only way to get things robust is along this path, and the only degrees of freedom you have is in that in the, in the positive versus non-zero index. That's what you're saying. 
Yeah, so in, indeed, non-zero index does most of the work here in, in, uh, for the robustness properties, at least, right? Because non-zero index is, I mean, the idea of the index is to look for robustness, right? That's why it was developed in mathematics. It's, this is not an, an, an econ invention. This is, it comes from mathematics and this perturbation theory, essentially, right? So the index gives you robustness properties, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that things are always, uh, or that doesn't make for a compatibility between a rationalistic approach and say an evolutionary approach. This is what I wanted to illustrate with the last example, right? So that a rationalistic approach that insists on, on existence in this game has no choice. You have to pick the only equilibrium there. Right? Evolution would say, oh, wait a bit. Uh, here, things never settle, right? The only block that is closed under better replies. So the only block that can be stable in some uh, evolutionary dynamics from a pretty wide class is the whole strategy space, right? So evolution here would yeah. go up and down and back and but forth. But that's good. That's fine. That's fine. We have many games like that. No, that I don't mind. So maybe, let me say it differently. It'd be nice to see maybe a property that you would like to have that is equivalent to robustness and then show that this is equivalent to your solid outcome, because the way it was presented more, but I don't see the details, is the more you have a out, you have a concept and you show what properties it has, right? That is what I meant by robustness. All the propositions basically give you robustness properties. You can uh, but they're not, but they aren't the defining strategies. properties. They're not hmm? the defining properties. There, you you present a sequence of of character properties of a given definition instead yeah. of starting with desirability and showing that this leads to the definition, but it's probably the same. I just, um, I'm just thinking about where you come from. That's the thing, but I'll have to think more about it. In the definition, there's, the definition says the uh, solid outcome has to be induced by the strategies in the component with non-zero index, right? Non-zero index is a formalization of robustness. But it's the formulation that we want to have. So you're basically saying that this is the one that you want to have. There are a lot of open questions it's, here that, that is sense, yes, that's what I want to have because that basically boils down to saying that the intersection of the best re, the graphs of the best reply correspondence is transverse. And that's what you want, right? And that's the notion that also has been used in many other applications of this branch of mathematics. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, I would have uh, one more question, if I may. Uh, yeah, um, which is the, the relation to- Martin, by the way, turn on your camera. Yeah, I think I did. Oh, uh... No, I can only see white. Oh, oh, this is because they're still, okay, now, <laughs> now I'm there. Hi. Uh, can you again clarify, because it was very quick, uh, the relation to strategic stability. So there are stable components, which are not, um, solid outcomes, right? Or which do not lead to solid outcomes. Is that true? Because you said every every solid outcome uh, contains, by... contains a strategically stable set. So every, okay. So every solid outcome is supported by a strategy in a strategically stable set. By a strategy. So, but, but they, yes. uh, okay. In a component of a strategically stable set, is that true that uh, they all lead to the same outcome? I guess right. So generically, generically in extensive form space, indeed, all equilibrium the same component lead to the same outcome. Otherwise, uh, this would be a contradiction to the Krebs and Wilson result, right? Okay. Because the components are connected, and I could vary continuous. I get a continuum of outcomes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So generically, indeed, the outcome is the same for all equilibrium the component. That's why I said earlier you can support an outcome in different ways of equilibrium. Yes, sure, sure. That's sure, how that, the different yeah. strategies come up. That's okay. clear, yeah, yeah. And, and now basically, I mean, if I, if I want to have a very coarse picture of, of your paper, is it, uh, is it, is it uh, fair to say, uh, basically you eliminate some of the strategic components, that, some of the stable sets that you don't like, so to speak, yes. and the yes. others you keep? Yes, indeed. That's, that's a fair way of saying it, right? 
that we like strategic stability, but yeah. it has some aspects that we don't like. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And those aspects we try to kill. Yes, that's a fair picture. Yeah. Okay. And, and basically, if I take now a, a particular solid outcome and a strategic stable set that supports it, um, these this, this minimal game blocks that, that basically, uh, you know, uh, it killed. use this. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say this, actually. Uh, is, is, is there something in, in, this, uh, in these blocks that does not take a positive probability in the supporting uh, strategically stable set? Can you say that again? I'm not yeah, sure that... you have these game blocks, right? And you say, okay, mm -hmm. I need a minimal block yeah. for my concept, right? Now mm -hmm. take such a minimal block, take the outcome that you get from there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, that that's if I understood right, a unique equilibrium in this, or the outcome of a unique equilibrium of that game, right? That's mm -hmm. if I understood right. Now, uh, now take the uh, strategically stable set or strategy in the strategic stable that mm -hmm. supports this. Now look yeah. at a strategic stable set and look at all um, all pure actions that get positive probability under one of these strategies in the strategically stable set. Are okay. they in your game block or yes, they must be in the game. Out? Yes, yes. They are all Otherwise, okay. the game block wouldn't respect the equilibrium components. Yes. Okay, and now on the other hand, do you have more, or is the game block coinciding? We with could, support? we could have more. Yes, you could have more, and you have examples for that. Yes, I think so. In the old working paper version, yeah. Yes, no, it would be interesting to to understand what you know. Why do you need these additional poor strategies? You know, what's the maybe that helps to understand even deeper the difference between the two things okay it's just an, a, a, an open question that i pose so yeah but it's a good question and, and maybe we should uh, take one of those examples from the working paper version into the final version <laughs> yes yeah, so that one can you know try to understand uh, yeah. Yeah, and and then the only the only example that I found a little bit on the intuitive level a little bit unreasonable is the one where uh, the the one with the forward induction does it that so this this is the only thing that I you know yeah. uh, which is the outside that, option uh, that, that it, yeah that it selects also the outside option and uh, you have any deeper understanding why this happens. Oh, well, why this happens? Uh, it, yeah. the, so the reason in our framework is is pretty simple. Uh, the outside, uh, sorry, the, the forward induction equilibrium has index minus one, and the outside option component has index plus two. Mm -hmm. So there is not a single component that has index plus one. Mm -hmm. uh, in which case, we pick both uh, because we want the index sum to be plus one. Right. Now, as I said in the in the presentation. Uh, you could go further here, right? You could say, uh, we, uh, based on sustainability, we pick positive index components. Yeah. Then you would pick the outside option component. Okay, that's that's actually what Govindan, Laraki, and Pal do, right? Yeah. So in their, in their approach, only the outside option component is sustainable. We are sort of a bit undecided here at, at that point in time, at least. But, uh, we haven't discussed this enough, but at the moment we are we are more liberal, right? Can uh, I ask something here? How, how can an index two be sustainable? I mean, when you then we change, you must change the game because the index cannot be two afterwards, and it's a local. Uh, it's sustainable in, according. To, so, I should be more precise what they do in their paper. So they have first a characterization of sustainability for regular equilibria. Okay. Uh, and then they extend this to all games, not only regular games, by axioms, by two axioms essentially, and then show that this axiomatization leads to positive index. Okay. So if I buy this extension based on their axioms, then I would have to pick the outside option component with index plus two, right? And that would be the sustainable outcome. 
So this sustainable does not mean unique in a larger game anymore. No, it's it uh, it does so for regular games. Okay, but, but not for non-regular games, it's by these axioms that they pose. Okay. 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 Then let me continue. Uh, just you know, in in the in this forward induction example, I really like the forward induction outcome, not the outside option, right? And if I want oh, yeah. to select that, I would. I would have to go for absolute value of the index being equal to one or something. I don't know. Well, <laughs> come on. No, but the index forward is, in that, is based no, on no, orientation. So but, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but how should I? How should I? I mean, if I want the forward induction outcome, you don't have any support for that. Sorry. If I want to select the forward induction outcome, you don't have any supporting. We no solid outcomes will not support you in in that respect. You have to pick some other concept. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you want to pick that, but I mean, think of it. It's it's not so clear, right? I mean, all these forward induction stories they are based on on, on speeches that players give to each other off equilibrium, knowing that they will never do that right? <laughs> because it's off equilibrium. <laughs> Which is strange. Right? I mean, you know, it's an old debate, actually. This, uh, for a long time, I, I actually didn't understand what forward induction means. It was only until Eric came up with a definition that only applies to two player games, there it made sense to me. That was a, the example that I gave was actually a two player game, right? So that it was one of the cases where forward induction makes sense to me. But, um, you know, whether it's generally a reasonable concept, I'm still not sure. I don't know. But it, it, has an, it has an indirect, you know, it has an appeal of, of you know, uh, assumptions about the reasoning process of players, right? So I yeah, see you not taking the, I see you not taking the, um, the outside option you could have gotten to now there's only one action of yours that could ever give you free it's an equilibrium of the continuation game so you know i have to think if klaus is rational he must have chosen free uh, that the one that know all these stories free. yes <laughs> so and if you are if you think that i'm clever enough uh, to figure this out okay you will go for the free uh, you know, so I could profit from, you know, a bit of Donald Trumpian story. I could profit from you thinking that I'm stupid. If I also get free in the out, you know, that's <laughs> right. So, but uh, yeah. if you think that I'm clever, you will do it. Yeah, it, it all depends on how the equilibria are supported. Right? And that's, that's all. I mean, it but is, I find this, I think I it say, I find this a very, a very reasonable story. I mean, it has all this equilibrium mm -hmm. uh, philosophy behind, okay, all this philosophy that supports, you know, Nash and rationality and so on. If you take it one step further, you, you do get stuff like forward induction, at least, you know, I think as long as it's consistent with backward induction, say. I'm probably not such a rational person that I can take it that far. <laughs> no, but okay, let's let's leave it at this. But you know, I, I think this is this is really getting <laughs> philosophical, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, but thanks a lot for all your clarification. Any more? Any more questions? Just one question. Um, I'm a bit Hi, concerned. Hi, I'm a bit concerned because you can only restrict yourself to generic, extensive form games. And if I see it correctly, if you have something like cheap talk or a similar structure, you would be in a subset of you would be in a non-generic class of games. And I wonder whether there are ways to extend your approach to mm. such games in some form by being perhaps a bit more abstract and just having certain requirements on the best response correspondence or something like that. So clearly, I mean, it, that's pretty obvious. There's a very easy way to extend this to all games by just saying uh, it doesn't have to be the unique outcome, but by picking mm, okay. a set of outcomes. So that's completely trivial and easy to do, right? 
Uh, now, the generic extensive form game really comes, on the one hand, it comes, of course, from the Krebs and Wilson result. On the other hand, it comes from my experience by doing applications. I've never studied in an application a degenerate extensive form game. They're always generic, right? They're never ties, because when you write the thing down, you always have a pretty good idea of how the ties need to be broken. Or because you have a situation in mind, what happens, how these players interact when intermediaries set these prices on, on, uh, on uh, high frequency markets, right? They are never indifferent, really, right? I mean, <laughs> we don't know. The ties just don't show up when you when you model these. So anything like cheap talk is not a good game in your sense. No, no. I mean, cheap talk is a class of games where you can have these things, right? Uh, but again, it's it's uh, you assume basically that all the messages cost the same, right? Which will never be the case in reality, right? Yeah, but you don't know the cost, and that's where you exactly. Uh, and then you apply the Lapla Laplace principle, which is something I've never understood. Okay, <laughs> it has to be the same just because we don't know. <laughs> I've never understood that. <laughs> okay, I'll think about it, but yeah, I, I still think that. Um, I don't think that generic extensive form is the last, is the only class of games to be considered. There are yeah. subclasses which are of interest in themselves. Sure, and that, that's why I said there's an obvious way to generalize this to all games uh, and then you're done. Right? But we, we wanted to insist on this generic class because I, I did, basically that's what you need in practice. Right? Please feel free to ask. Gali, I, I can't, you're yes. hard to hear. Sorry, uh, I'm saying if there are further questions, then please feel free to ask. Yeah. Uh, and if not, then we thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm stopping the recording. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>